Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tom Armitage. I'm going to wait a little longer. We're still getting people joining the meeting. Allison and Tom, I see you're, you've got your video off. Do you want us on video or off video? Uh, well, you can turn it on and off, whichever you'd prefer. Okay. Well, I just yeah. didn't know what the norm was because now you guys came on. Sorry. You were... <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll have mine on once we, once we kick off. Yeah. Thanks. I think we're just about ready to get started. Still, uh, still waiting for a few more people. Thank you, Tom. Okay, well, I guess we could get started. We have a quorum now, so uh, I think I'll I'll get started, and we may get more people joining as we move along. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Armitage. I am uh, from the EPA Science Advisory Board office. I'm the designated federal officer for the EPA Science Advisory Board, and I'd like to convene this public meeting of the Chartered Science Advisory Board I'm going to just make a few uh, remarks before we begin. Um, the board is meeting today to discuss recommendations received from the Science Supporting Decisions Work Group regarding uh, review of proposed EPA regulatory actions. Uh, I'd first like to note that the Science Advisory Board is uh, an independent expert advisory committee. It's chartered under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and it's empowered by law to provide scientific and technical advice to the EPA administrator. Science Advisory Board meetings and deliberations are held as public meetings that meet the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. The discussions of the SAB and its interactions with the public and with EPA are conducted in sessions where I am present as the DFO to ensure that requirements of FACA, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, are met. The uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act also requires that public meetings provide an opportunity for public comment. And we do have a public comment period on the agenda for this meeting. Members of the public who have registered in advance with the SAB office can make oral comments during the comment period. And I'll note that we have received one request to provide oral comments at this meeting. Members of the public can also submit uh, written comments for consideration by the SAB. 
and any written comments received are provided to SAB members and posted on the SAB meeting website. I'd also like to note that uh, minutes of this meeting will be prepared to summarize the discussion and the action items in accordance with the requirements of FACA. The minutes will be certified by the SAB chair and posted on the SAB website. The Science Advisory Board Office is holding this meeting virtually using Zoom. So I wanna let all attendees know that we have provided members of the public access to this meeting through a teleconference line and a live webcast, and that all the materials being discussed are available on the SAB website. SAB consists of special government employees appointed by the EPA. Board members are serving as independent scientific and technical experts and not as representatives of any group. And as government employees, SAB members are subject to applicable ethics laws. And I'd just like to inform everyone that the SAB office has determined that the SAB members participating in this meeting have no financial conflicts of interest or appearance of lack of impartiality concerning the topics on the agenda. So I'm gonna take roll. And before I do that, I'd just like to ask members of the public who are listening on the webcast to send me an email indicating that you're uh, present so I can include that in the meeting minutes for the record. So I'm just gonna run through the board uh, roster now and make sure I have a record of everyone who's here. So please let me know when I call your name that you're here. Dr. Allison Cullen. Present. Dr. Marjorie Aileon. Present. Dr. David Allen. Dr. Susan Annenberg. Present. Dr. Florence Anuro. Present. Dr. Joe Arvai. Present. Dr. Barbara Beck. Present. Dr. Roland Benke. Present. Dr. Tammy Bond. Present. Dr. Mark Borsak. Dr. Sylvie Bruder. Present. Dr. Jay Chakraborty. Present. Dr. Amin Chen. Dr. Amy Childress, Dr. Wei Sui Chu. Present. Dr. Ryan Emanuel. Present. Dr. Earl Fordham. Dr. John Guckenheimer. Present. Dr. Steve Hamburg. Present. Dr. Celine Hernandez Ruiz. Here. Dr. Alina Irwin. Present. Dr. Dave Kaiser. Present. Dr. Mark. Present. Lich Thank you, Dave. Dr. Mark LeChevalier. Dr. Angela Lund. Present. Ms. Lisa Lonefight. Present. Dr. Lala Ma. Dr. John Morris. Dr. Enid Neptune. Dr. Sheila Olmstead. Present. Dr. Austin Omer. Present. Dr. Gloria Post. <coughs> Dr. Christy Pullen Fednick. Dr. Amanda Rodewald. Present. Dr. Emma Rossi. Present. Dr. Jonathan Samet. Dr. Leanne Shepard. Dr. Drew Shindell. Dr. Janae Smith. Present. Dr. Richard Smith. Present. Dr. Daniel Stram. Present. Dr. Peter Thorne. Present. Dr. Godfrey Uzo Chekwu. Present. Dr. Wei Sung Wang. Dr. June Weintraub. Present. Dr. Sakobi Wilson. Dr. Dominic van der Mensbrug. Present. Great. Okay. Thank you all very much. And with that, I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Tom Brennan, Director of the SAB Office, for his remarks. 
public meeting of the Science Advisory Board. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, you know, as we were preparing for this meeting, because we've got uh, several uh, regulatory actions to review, I was impressed by um, the diversity of work being done at the agency. And I'd like to thank all my colleagues at the agency for all the hard work they've done to even make this uh, review today possible. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of activity going on right now. And I know everyone's working hard. So thank you uh, to my teammates at the EPA. I'd also like to give a special thank to the work group of the SAB that's been uh, sort of the front line in handling the first cut at these activities. Uh, I probably don't thank them enough. It's been a, a, a lot of work. It's been interesting, and, uh, but it's been a lot. And I'd like to really thank all of you who have made the commitment to, on behalf of the board, to be the sort of the first look at these and try to and try to get a handle on them that we can present to the board today. So thank you so much to the work group. I'd like to thank Allison, our chair. It's a lot of work, Allison. Um, you're doing a great job, thank you. I'd like to thank the SAB staff office and particularly uh, Tom Armitage uh, for being a great DFO. And I'm uh, looking forward to the meeting. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm just gonna turn it over to Allison. Thanks very much, Tom. And I would echo right back at you. Thanks to the SAB staff office and certainly EPA who's met with us and given us briefings at the work group and, and really responded to questions we've had. So yeah, so I'll kick it off. I'm Allison Cullen, as Tom just said, and good morning for the West Coast. Good afternoon for the East Coast. I'm the chair of the board. Um, I wanna welcome all the members of the chartered SAB, also the staff office, EPA staff, the public uh, to this public meeting. We'll begin by reviewing the purpose of the meeting and the agenda. The chartered SAB is meeting today to discuss the recommendations received from the work group, as Tom and Tom both said. Um, and we're looking at you know, potential review by the SAB of EPA planned regulatory actions. So the first item um, on today's agenda is a public comment period. We have received one request to provide oral public comments. Public comments uh, at the SAB meeting are conducted um, as part of the web conferences. They're limited to three minutes per speaker. And if SAB members have questions for the speaker, you'll have time to ask them after the speaker presents. I also want to note that for members of the public, there's also an opportunity to submit written public comments and any written public comments will be posted on the SAB meeting webpage and made available to SAB members. And then there's also a second public comment period uh, oral on the agenda. So members of the public who wish to provide short, these are two or three minute clarifying comments near the end of the meeting today should send an email to Tom Armitage, the designated federal officer. His email address is on the SAB meeting website. And then following public comments, we're going to discuss recommendations that have been provided to the chartered SAB in a memo from the SAB work group for review of science supporting EPA decisions. That memo went out on June 5th. Um, it was concerning review of 19, yes, we are going to talk about 19 planned regulatory actions. We'll decide whether we agree as a board to uh, move ahead with work group recommendations or whether other follow-up activities are needed. Um, the memorandum is posted on the SAB website with the materials for this meeting. So before beginning, are there any questions from SAB members? Aside from, yes, really 19 actions we're gonna look at today. All right, so let's move to public comment. Uh, we have one speaker who has registered for public comment today. The comments will be limited to three minutes, as I said, and then if uh, SAB members have questions, we'll have a question period for the speaker um, if warranted. So our public speaker who's registered for today is James Enstrom of UCLA and Scientific Integrity Institute. Go ahead, Dr. Enstrom. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'm Dr. James Enstrom. I've had a long career as an environmental epidemiologist at UCLA. I'm president of the Scientific Integrity Institute and a member of the CO2 Coalition. I've submitted many comments to EPA criticizing its air pollution science, and unfortunately, all these comments have been ignored. Thus, it is very important that SAB fully uh, review the science supporting EPA regulatory actions. In particular, the SAB should review item three, multi-pollutant emissions standards for various vehicles. B 
because EPA's own peer review is severely deficient. EPA assumes that air pollution from motor vehicles continues to impact public health in spite of very strong evidence that current air pollution regulations and levels in the United States are below the threshold of human health effects. It is very important that SAB and EPA examine the evidence that the linear no threshold model is wrong and recognize thresholds below which there are no health effects. For example, University of Massachusetts Professor Edward Calabrese has very strong evidence of a threshold regarding ionizing radiation. EPA peer review is not objective because of investigator bias, funding bias, publication bias, and citation bias. EPA would never select a critic like myself to be a peer reviewer and has ignored essentially all the criticism of its science and regulations. Thus, many scientists like myself are reaching out to legislators, impacted businesses, and the general public. For instance, I've become friends with Dr. John Clauser, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2022, and who is now a board member of the CO2 Coalition. Dr. Clauser has stated, quote, the popular narrative about climate change reflects a dangerous corruption of science that threatens the world's economy and the well-being of billions of people, unquote. In summary, the SAB, needs to fully and objectively reassess the science supporting EPA regulations. Many EPA regulations are hurting America and are giving a competitive advantage to competitor nations like communist China. Finally, it would be much better if critics like myself could have more than three minutes out of a five hour meeting to make our case and could actually interact with EPA scientists and SAB members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comment. I'll now turn to the board and see if there are questions for Dr. Enstrom. All right, thank you very much for your comment and for taking the time and coming to, to speak with us. I'd now like to turn to the discussion of recommendations from the SAB workgroup for the review of science supporting EPA decisions. And I'd like to review the process first that we use for determining whether the SAB conducts reviews of the adequacy of science and technical bases for planned regulatory actions. This is under ERDA, the Environmental Research Development and Demonstration Authorization Act of 1978. It requires EPA to make available to the Science Advisory Board proposed criteria documents, standards, limitations, or regulations that are provided to any other federal agency for formal review and for comment, together with any relevant science and technical information on which the proposed actions are based. The SAB may then make available to the administrator within a time frame specified by the administrator its advice and any comments on the adequacy of that scientific and technical basis. To fulfill these requirements, EPA and SAB follow a process that includes a number of elements. EPA submits to the SAB staff office information regarding planned actions in the agency's semi-annual regulatory agenda. Um, and this is you know, anything that's expected to undergo interagency review. The EPA transmits to the staff office all proposed actions that are sent to OMB for interagency review, as well as any relevant supporting scientific and technical information then the SAB workgroup holds monthly meetings to examine and sort of screen those planned actions that are sent to the SAB office. Um, we can receive information about planned actions. We can identify aspects of any that may warrant review by the full SAB. And then we prepare a report to the full SAB with recommendations for or against peer review for each planned action. And then, of course, today, the chartered SAB holds public meetings to decide whether to undertake SAB peer review or not, as recommended by the work group. We have a work group consisting of myself as chair and doctors David Allen, Barbara Beck, Jay Chakraborty, Stephen Hamburg, Celine Hernandez Ruiz, Sheila Olmsted, Christy Pullen Fednick, Amanda Rodewall, Jonathan Samet, Peter Thorne, Godri Uzuchaklu, and Jean Weintraub. And I see that we have most of those people with us today. 
The work group met on January 27th, February 24th, March 31st, April 28th, and May 26th of 2023 to discuss the adequacy of science and technical bases that support and underlie planned EPA regulatory actions. The group developed recommendations concerning SAB review, and we have those 19 actions in our June 5th memo from the work group. The memo is posted on the SAB website along with materials for this meeting. As indicated in the memo, the work group is recommending that SAB re review the adequacy of the science supporting two of the 19 planned actions listed in the memo. And I will now ask the board to discuss and decide whether it agrees with the work group's recommendations. Before we move to that step, I would like to ask board members if there are any questions about the process. All right, seeing none, I will say that with 19 actions, I thought that that's a lot of actions to have one person talking and introducing in one voice, and it's really nice to share that and move the voice around. So I've asked several work group members to begin discussion and sort of initiate and launch the discussion of planned actions listed in the memo. We're changing the order just slightly. We are going to start with item number 19 and then item 15, and then we'll run through in the order that the memo presents. This was in response to a request from EPA from some members who preferred to attend at the beginning of the meeting and to allow that. So I am going to move um, to that in just a second. And then after each action, we'll call for a voice vote on whether the SAB supports the recommendation or prefers to do something different. It's completely the SAB's decision what to do and how to proceed. So Steve Hamburg is going to introduce the 19th and final item first, as I said. This is RIN 2060 AV83. It's GHG reporting rule, revisions and confidentiality determinations for petroleum and natural gas systems. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks so much, Dr. Collin. Greatly appreciate it. So this, um, this issue comes up in a little bit of context. Um, so in the Inflation Reduction Act of August 22, um, there's a requirement under the Methane Emissions Reduction Program to um, revise the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program as it applies to oil and gas and several categories of facilities under the reporting program related to that. The key characteristics of this change relates to the fact that the it needs to be these uh, the reporting program needs to be based on uh, empirical data that demonstrates that it's accurate um, with respect to the total emissions, um, and that so those characteristics are not currently part of, of, of the um, the greenhouse gas reporting program. So this difference uh, is is can potentially have large impact on how the data will be collected to develop the uh, the reporting under the GHG RP. Um, and so this, this was, as I understand it, was developed in order to sort of address some of the uh, existing scientific literature, which shows inconsistencies between um, what's in the literature and empirically based and what the reporting program has historically shown. Um, so this is also critical because this is the basis of assigning a fee on emissions in excess of set levels in the um, legislation um, uh, for those different types of facilities. So this has a very direct financial implication for uh, different companies. Um, there is a rich scientific literature that has developed over the last decade about quantifying methane emissions from these different types of facilities in the United States. It represents uh, many, many dozens of papers uh, I'm sure well in excess of 100. I haven't done a recent count, but it is a rich literature. And that is critical because there's also diversity of methods that have been evolved over the last decade to make these measurements um, and make the and understand how accurate they are. Um, this is also an important point because this is the first requirement um, to base reporting on empirical data and to assess the accuracy. So those, those two requirements set up um, the, the sort of real importance of science and the scientific literature um, to be able to address at the facility level uh, the data that um, is out there and ensuring the reporting is accurate. Now, I, I'm stressing this because this then, in my view, and I think the subcommittee's view, fits very closely to the mandate of the Science Advisory Board in the sense that there is a large scientific literature 
these requirements have not been previously, or the strategy that will be um, is being developed by EPA and will be proposed has not been peer reviewed. And so there is a real opportunity to bring our collective uh, wisdom and reflection across the many disciplines to understanding the degree to which the proposed regulation meets the requirement of the Inflation Reduction Act to base the uh, reporting on empirical data and ensure that it's accurate. So, um, so we recommended that we take on this review. I think it, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me personally. I think that the workshop, as I said, um, and I will happy to answer questions. And I know there are folks from EPA who would as well uh, if people have a, a additional questions or, can, or, or issues they'd like to raise. Thanks very much, Steve. Board members, it's open for discussion and questions. Dr. Schindel. Yeah, hi. I, I just wanted to say that I fully endorse what Steve said. And there is, this is really something where the literature is burgeoning, and especially over the next uh, couple of years, it's likely to get lots more stuff. So our, our review of this, I think, would be very timely and very valuable to the community. So just want to second pretty much what Stephen just said. Thanks. Thank you. Are there others? All right, it seems, oh, there we have Dr. Bond, go ahead. I hit the wrong button. I'm not supposed to be laughing. Um, <laughs> all right, so, well, now I am laughing at myself. Um, so I was on the, the review of the oil and gas standards, and one of the things that became uh, really apparent to me was that we're really in a new era of this uh, where there's all this information and we're able to use empirical data. And it's a it's something that I think it's a, it's a new framework for EPA as well, right? And so um, I, I think we just need to acknowledge that we're in an evolving situation and learn how to evolve. So I support the notion of reviewing it. And, um, and it, I I just want to acknowledge this really important time in the shift uh, to to empirically based, um, reality based understanding of emissions. Thanks, Tammy. Are there any other comments? Anything else specific that would be part of a review? We are about to vote on that. It does seem that we are leaning that way. All right, I don't see any other comments. Uh, so I think this one is a sort of a standalone. And so I'll just ask for a motion to approve or disapprove uh, and a second, and then we'll vote. I'm happy to motion that we approve. Sorry, talked over somebody. Thank you, Dr. Hamburg. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Dr. Thorne. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. So thank you very much, Dr. Hamburg and, and board for this discussion. All right, so as I said, we're now also remaining out of order just for one more action. We're going to move to uh, number 15. So this is um, the RIN 2060 AV09 and RIN 2060 AV10. It's new source performance standards for GHG emissions uh, from new modified and reconstructed fossil fuel fired EGUs, emission guidelines for GHGs from existing fossil fuel fired EGUs and repeal of the Affordable Clean Energy Act. Um, so the work group had recommended that the chartered SAB review the adequacy of science and technical underpinnings of this rule as well. In particular, the work group recommended that the chartered SAB review the potential effects of fugitive emissions of hydrogen used in the BSER. This is the best system of emission reduction for Section 111 of the Clean Air Act. Um, so the EPA is proposing 
a set of things. They're proposing revised new source performance standards for multiple categories, as I mentioned. First, for GHGs from the new fossil fuel fired stationary combustion turbine EGUs. Second, for GHGs from fossil fuel fired steam generating units that undertake a large modification. Um, that's based upon the eight year review required by the Clean Air Act. Third category, uh, proposing emission guidelines for GHGs from existing fossil fired steam generating EGUs, which include both coal fired and oil gas fired steam generation. Uh, fourth, EPA is also proposing emission guidelines for GSGs from the largest, uh, most frequently operated existing stationary combustion turbines. And they've been soliciting comment on approaches for emission guidelines for GHGs for the remainder of the existing combustion turbine category. So we had a, a briefing from them. They went in detail into each of these categories. And then finally, as I said, they're proposing to uh, repeal the affordable clean energy rule. Um, the proposal to repeal is because the emission guidelines established in the ACE don't reflect the BSER and they're inconsistent with Section 111 of the Clean Air Act. Um, I guess I would also note that the SER, the best system of emission reduction, that's the standard setting approach with new and existing power plants. The rule partially rests on co-firing with hydrogen and the work group suggesting that a closer look at how hydrogen leaks would be addressed is warranted. Um, hydrogen is not a GHG on its own, but it can react with other compounds and form GHGs. So there's a kind of trade-off between methane and hydrogen in this case. And the work group also wanted to note that, you know, we appreciate this is a very ambitious action. Um, and appreciate the, the efforts here by EPA, certainly. Um, some of the science is novel and uncertain, and we believe it warrants review by the Science Advisory Board. So I'll open this up to discussion now from the group. If there are no comments or questions, then I would ask for a motion. This would be a motion to either uh, approve or disprove the work group recommendation, although having heard no comments. I move that we um, vote to approve the recommendation. Thank I you. Don. Thank you, Dr. Olmsted. And then the second was, sorry. Dr. Bruder. Dr. Bruder, thank you. All right, we have a motion to approve the recommendation to review the scientific underpinnings. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you very much. The motion carries. And we will now get back into the set of 19 items in the order that they were presented uh, originally in the memo. Uh, so that means that we are moving to four planned actions that will be introduced by Dr. Thorne. I've asked him to kind of launch discussion of these, just as Steve and I have done for the previous two, and then provide a brief summary, and then we'll call for discussion. Thanks, Dr. Thorne. Okay. Welcome to all of you from the heartland. Um, this is RIN 2040 AF62, which is entitled Federal Baseline Water Quality Standards for Indian Reservations. Uh, just a little bit of background, the EPA is proposing a rule to establish water quality standards for Indian reservations that do not currently have these standards under the Clean Water Act. Uh, Clean Water Act Section 303 clearly contemplates that there will be water quality standards for all waters of the United States, but doesn't explicitly address Indian country waters. And as it turns out, over 80% of Indian reservations do not have this foundational protection for water quality. So addressing this lack uh, of Clean Water Act effective water quality standards for waters on about 250 Indian reservations is a priority for the EPA. Um, so promulgating baseline water quality standards would provide scientific rigor and regulatory certainty to um, NPDES, National Pollutant Discharge and Elimination System permits for discharges to these waters. And the baseline water quality standards would fulfill regulatory requirements, including establishing designated uses, water quality criteria to protect those uses, anti-degradation policies to protect high quality waters. So the EPA engaged extensively in coordination and consultation with the tribes throughout the consultation period. And this 
this uh, work with the tribes continues. So EPA's proposal to establish a federal baseline water quality standards includes promulgation of narrative criteria with binding translation procedures that accommodate the latest peer reviewed science when applying the baseline water quality standards. So the, the SAB work group uh, found that this planned action did not warrant further review of the supporting science by the chartered SAB. No new science will be developed nor relied upon in this rulemaking. And there was extensive consultation and collaboration with the uh, tribal uh, nations on this developing this. So that's my summary, Allison. Thanks a lot. And I would just add that EPA did also brief us as a work group on this one, and it was really well appreciated by the group. Um, it's just a very interesting time, and, and I think we all appreciated the briefing so much. So open for discussion. Uh, let's see. Lisa Lone fight. Go ahead. Hello. Um, so I, I appreciate um, hearing uh, tribes reservation, all of those words that um, are words that I live in a, on a daily basis. Um, I'd like to introduce a more broad question with regard to um, specific, specifically to programs having to do with tribes, reservations, but possibly more broadly applicable. So as we determine that there are no questions of science involved, um, <clears throat> are we also making a specific effort to determine whether there are any questions of indigenous science or TEK, um, traditional ecological knowledge based science involved? Um, are we, or are we defaulting to the more reductive um, view? The administration specifically requires addressing and utilizing indigenous science or TEK based science in these um, types of evaluations, as I understand it. I'm just wondering, I'm just asking the question, are we taking that extra step before we decide that there are no questions of science involved? Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for the, your comment. This was a topic that was discussed at our briefing. Um, and certainly in the EPA's meeting, extensive meetings with the, the various tribal nations, the traditional ecological knowledge uh, came up as, a, as an important factor for consideration. Um, so, I, I think it's fair to say that, that that discussion has been had and the EPA has heard very clearly about um, traditional ecological knowledge and its role in um, decision-making among tribal nations. So I guess that's my response. Yeah, thanks. It was uh, it was definitely a point of discussion. We We spent quite a bit of time on this. We also talked quite a bit about language and terminology and I will say, and and names and names do matter and labels do matter. And uh, it, you know, that is an evolving area. So we also spent time on that um, because I think for many, some of these terms are jarring and that's understandable. And the other thing I think it's important to <coughs> point out is that, you know, the, the tribal nations are themselves diverse and don't necessarily have a single view. And so I think the EPA, really reached out to many different groups to try and um, have the full range of experience, and knowledge, and viewpoints uh, among the tribal nations. So um, I understand that. Um, and I apologize that I wasn't a part of this conversation earlier. Um, this is our field season. And so I'm um, in the middle of, I've been out in the field um, for the last two weeks, three weeks. And so I just feel like there's a, as a, as a, as a SAB, as a science advisory board, I really feel like this is, when we're talking about science, we don't, we don't refer to that. And so um, when we look at, let's say TEK, I don't feel like we are um, doing our due diligence in terms of that. And um, when um, the administrator was here, we had spoke with him about that and what that is. And um, he was very interested and, and saw the importance of it. And so I do understand that there are different tribes that are in different places with that. And, and that's great. And there is a language barrier um, in terms of how you, how are we translating 
these terms um, into those that the elders and some of the um, knowledge carriers are able to access. And so, again, I think that there's some issues of access here and there's some um, issues that we might need to delve in deeper um, that I think are important right now. And it, this is an opportunity, I think, for SAB to be able to um, to do that when, when it's never been done actually before. Yeah, thanks for these points. And we, we did take note of um, comments and tried to carry everyone's questions and discussion points into that bigger conversation uh, with EPA. There was a lot of discussion of what exactly is being done in terms of engagement uh, with tribal nations, there, there are many different groups involved, and, and each one, I think, needs specific and particular um, issues covered. These are, you know, th there's not going to be sort of one, uh, one handling of these systems across all tribal nations. Um, so that, I think, the work group was very interested in the different ways and the different parts of the country and the different lands and how... EPA was listening and engaging and hearing and learning from uh, their tribal partners. And so, yeah, that was that was definitely part of what we heard about. And um, and I think we will be having these kinds of conversations about other actions as well. And I think it's really important. And I think we're all kind of, we're learning from some of these um, briefings and steps about what is going on and thinking about the future. So really appreciate these points. And I think that's helpful for some of what will come next. Other comments from the group? I guess I'm just gonna say one one more thing because I I don't feel like um I'm I'll just say one more thing. So um, I understand what you're saying, and and I'm not saying that that's not a question, um, but the question is possibly for this group is are we considering indigenous science as a science question? So if we are. And how are we how are we answering that? And there are ways to do that. There are tools that we can use to glean that information and make sure that's a part of our conversation. And are we doing that? Um, and no, it's going to be different from tribe to tribe in a way, but not the overall arching question. And I think that's something that we're trying to um, to to look at. And also, are we looking at this as a board? as opposed to this is something that tribes should be um, adding to or taking care of and, and looking at it that way. Because if we do water it down that way, then it is, I mean, it's, it's enormous, but as a board, how are we considering that? Um, I guess that's, that, that's my comment, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Anarul. Yes, I wanted to um, add to what Dr. Longfight just um, stated. I know in our previous discussions, we've talked about um, citizen science and lived experience uh, being incorporated into issues like this. And it also um, speaks volume of the environmental justice aspect of it. So I'm happy that this is um, uh, in, on the radar and, and also being prioritized. And, um, and I, and I think it should be um, put right there um, as a priority for EPA and then figuring out the best way to have the community uh, engage as well as having science um, back in it. Thank you. And certainly was prioritized in our conversation. I wanna also say the Infrastructure um, Act also has funds and programs, so I think a number of the actions we're going to look at are, will be related to that. And then we also have a set of, of EJ actions that we've been tracking pretty closely. Um, so yes, on all of that, seconded, thirded, thank you. Dr. Emanuel. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, I'm, I'm of two minds. I, won't, I, uh, I read the REN and you know, I'm, I'm pleased that EPA um, has spent so much time and attention on this. But on the other hand, I I echo um, uh, Lisa Lonefight's um, concerns, and I, I would just articulate it a slightly different way and say that I often hear um, Western science organizations um, speak deferentially towards indigenous knowledge systems. 
uh, in a way that that others them and silos them. And may, maybe that is appropriate in this case or in other cases, but I think we won't always be able to do that as uh, Western scientific entities. We need to figure out uh, when and how to grapple with indigenous knowledge systems and, and review it um, in ways that are rigorous and appropriate to the, the, the ontology itself. And I, I don't know if this is the, 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 the place and time to do it, but I just want to I, I want to flag that there is a there is a limit to the the deference to indigenous knowledge systems, where at some point it it starts to become punting it back to um, tribes themselves to to grapple with the science. And and I think in those cases, EPA and other bodies may actually be doing a disservice um, by not elevating um, uh, indigenous knowledge systems to the same level of. Um, of uh, 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 rigor that we that we treat other disciplines, but again, I don't I don't know the answer, and I don't know if this is the the place to to grapple with it more thoroughly. But it is something that I I see more of um, in Western scientific institutions, and wanted to mark that here. Yeah, I really appreciate these points, and I will not pretend that I have the answer to this, um, and I have not seen the answer um, out there. But I do think this is a continuing conversation. Lisa Lonefight, please go ahead. So um, I think this is a great conversation. What I don't want to do is we have 19 items to go through. I don't want to bog this um, conversation down with that right now. But what I would like to do is um, work with, and I've talked with um, leaders at Region 8, and then, of course, the administrator when he visited here. This is something that, imagine um, if we just, we just took an area of science and we said, okay, we're going to leave that one out because we're not kind of sure what, what, what that is right now. But later on, we find out, oh, that was really important. So now it, it's a part of our conversation. It's embedded in it. And so what I feel like um, we need to do is have people who are like-minded on the SAB actually um, have their own um, committee, have their own um conversation with that and bring that back to the SAB and say, okay, these are the things that we reviewed and this is how um, we're, we're looking at um, these things. Yeah, thanks. And, I, and we are collecting actually topics for our in-person meeting, which will be in September. And among those are review of EJ guidance through the agency. And I think that maybe a separate topic on this would be very well appreciated. And I think it would be timely. So um, a conversation earlier than that. We don't want just to arrive at the meeting and then start talking about it. It would require planning ahead and talking about exactly what content we want to cover and what scope. Um, yeah. So in order to make that happen in an effective way, Dr. Right. Einstein. And, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, so just real quick. So mm -hmm. um, what I'm saying is l let's say that um, we saw like silo chemistry uh, then, but we're, so we're not, um, it has to do with addressing how it, maybe the lens that we're viewing things through um, when we're doing our evaluation. And so I think we'll, I think we can get there, but I think there's um, a different maybe way that we need to look at um, addressing these things. So that's, in, that's a, par a part of things. Right now in doing my climate change um, work for our tribe, I refer to TEK quite a bit because it's such old science. There's so much data there for that. And we need that when we're looking at climate change. And so um, that's just an example of um, what I think needs to be brought to the table. And I say indigenous because there are, of course, um, indigenous peoples all over the world that are doing this. And so, um, I just feel like, uh, again, this is an opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think it is an opportunity and I really appreciate these points being raised. And I actually think this is work for generations and for lifetimes. I think that we can you know, make progress, but I also think that this is not something where we're going to just check a box and say, okay, in the next three months, we've now you know, cracked this nut. So I think a conversation about what scope we'd like to bring when we, especially when we meet in person, I think it's a great place to have those conversations. And, you know, in my own work in, in wildfire and wildland, it's been 
fascinating to see how our suppression of fire and our sort of turning away from indigenous practice and cultural burning has really led to a lot of the problems we're having today. So I'm very much, you know, in my own work, I'm very much in the TEK um, appreciation because honestly, it's made such a, yeah, it's had such an impact. I, I see that I missed Dr. Olmsted. You had your hand up and then Dr. Bond. Sorry, I see that hands are going up and down. Short to my colleagues. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bond. And then we'll need to bring this one to a, a vote. But I but I also, before I say that, I also would say we're not just trying to march through this agenda. We do want to get through it. But for many of our regulatory actions that we discuss, there are specific topics that arise that may or may not be covered well by just the work that we need to do on a specific action. And so we're always attentive to that. We're always watching for that. And uh, this may be a case where I, I think we can do better in a in a broader way and with the whole board focused on that exact topic. So thank you, Dr. Bond. Go ahead. Well, just more on this uh, this topic in which I am not an expert, um, but what I heard happening here was the presentation of an issue that affects tribes. Um, a, a, a question about how TEK was included in the consideration, um, and then an acknowledgement that people recognized it to be important and had discussed it at length, and yet there was not, um, it, it's easy to, to feel a lack of confidence because there are so many issues that have been disre disregarded throughout history um, that, that one doesn't know if a discussion has covered the things that, that, that typically need to be covered. And so I, I guess as, as we go forward with this, I would just advocate for some way of being more clear when, when we are getting closer to sufficiency and due diligence so that even people like myself who aren't expert in this can ask those questions and can have a sense of when, uh, when we're beginning to do the right thing. So I appreciate you bringing this forward, Dr. Lone Fight. And um, I, I feel reluctant to place another burden upon you, but but help us know how to do better. I really appreciate that, Dr. Bond. And also I think Dr. Emanuel's comment was so well-placed about, you know, how how, sh how should we review and interpret and understand different kinds of knowledge? I think that was really, because that is part of the question. So thank you all for this conversation. Let, oh, me, sorry. Just, let me just add- the Go ahead, Peter. One, one of the reasons the work group asked for a briefing on this was because we had these very concerns. Uh, we, we wondered about the language, we wondered about the interaction with uh, the various tribal interests, how well they were accessed, um, how they were included in the decision-making process. And I think the briefing made the work group feel much better about that, that there had been extensive outreach and engagement. Um, and so, just to let you know that the work group shared these concerns at the outset, and I think um, is also of a, of a mind that we need to learn more about tribal practices and 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 uh, ecological knowledge that comes from their traditions. Thanks, Dr. Thorne. So I think what I'd like to propose is that we bring this one to a vote, but let's carry this broader topic into our summer discussions as we prepare for our autumn meeting, because I think we could be, there are ways that we can make progress. And as I said, we're always sort of looking at individual regulatory actions, but also there are topics that arise that are, I think they really transcend those regulatory actions. And I think that this is one of those. Um, but yes, the work group actually did spend, well, we ended up spending much more of our agenda on this particular action when we met, because the briefing was was terrific in terms of telling us what was going on, but then we asked a tremendous number of questions of EPA, which they patiently answered about exactly how they were engaging tribal nations. So it, it became a very, um, it was a pretty powerful experience just learning about some of that. And I think, as I say, I think some of this transcends this particular action. So I'm going to uh, make a note of that. And I know Tom and Tom are making a note of that as well. Oh, so... Lisa Lonefoot, you still have your hand up. Did you want to say one more thing? And then we'll, oh, it's down. I just okay. left I a always... comment in the okay. chat. I, I just left a comment in the oh, chat. Okay. And I, I, I'm hoping that that, that, that should be it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I see it in the chat. I, I don't always have the chat open when I'm looking at all of your faces, seeing whose hand is up. So uh, yeah, definitely raise those verbally if I'm missing them. 
Um, appreciate that input. And I think, um, yeah, I, I have many thoughts about this, but I think I've said them and I don't want to take up too much space here. So I, I think given the discussion we've had about, you know, a broader discussion about um, uh, traditional ecological knowledge in the broader context of EJ, I'd like to um, move that we um, accept the recommendation to not have a review of this particular RIN. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Emmanuel. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Emmanuel. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I abstain. Thank you. Thanks. And I further would note that from this one, we're carrying forward um, into our summer work and then into our autumn meeting, uh, a broader discussion, because I think that that is timely and important. And we're hearing um, from others that they believe that as well. So much appreciated. All right, we're going to turn to Peter for the next of your set. Go ahead. Yes. So this is RIN 2070 AL02. The title is Revisions to Regulations on Persistent Biocumulative and Toxic Chemicals. We call those PBT chemicals, subject to TOSCA Section 6H. So the Toxic Substances Control Act requires EPA to act on certain uh, persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals to address the risks of injury to health or damage to the environment presented by the chemical substance and to reduce exposure to the substance to the extent that is practicable. So PBT chemicals are uh, of particular concern, not only because they're, they're quite toxic in many cases, but because they remain in the environment for long periods of time and can bioaccumulate. So consistent with this mandate, the, the EPA issued final risk management rules restricting the use of five particular PBT chemicals. Uh, and these were issued in January 2021 and went into effect February 2021. Uh, EPA is now considering revisions to all five of the final rules that would further reduce exposures, uh, promote environmental justice, and better protect human health in the environment. Um, for the Toxicologists among us, I, I'll just name the five chemicals. Uh, Decabromodiphenyl ether, um, a 3-1 mixture of phenol and phenol and isopropylated phosphate. Uh, the third one is 2-4-6 tristertbutylphenol. Uh, the fifth, fourth is hexachlorobutadiene, and the fifth is pentachlorothiopentol, uh, phenol rather. So um, those are largely used in, as plasticiders, flame retardants, uh, intermediates in manufacture, um, used to make rubber pliable in industrial uses and so forth. Uh, so to support this work, the EPA conducted a comprehensive literature review to identify, screen, extract, and evaluate exposure information for the chemicals. Uh, it also compiled the physical chemical properties and extensive information on their uses. Um, the EPA developed a hazard summary document for these five chemicals to identify the known hazards and report hazard data from the literature, but with no additional analysis or assessment. Available hazard information uh, from the literature was tabulated and summarized, and the analyses supported the final risk management rules for these five compounds, and those were issued in January 2021. Uh, both the exposure and use assessment and environmental hazard summary documents were peer reviewed between June and August of 2018. So the SAB workgroup uh, found that this planned action didn't warrant further review because the materials supporting the current version are peer reviewed and all the analytical methods used to develop the rule are not new and no new uh, science on these particular chemicals was developed for this particular um, uh, ran, ran. So with that, that concludes my summary. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so SAB, we're open for discussion. All right, well, the work group proposal is that no review is warranted. Uh, seeing no comments or questions, then I would ask for a motion to approve the recommendation of no review. 
I'll motion. Omer. Thank you, Dr. Second. Omer. I'll second as Joe. Thank you for second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. So the motion carries and we affirm the work group recommendation of no review. Peter, I believe you've got a couple more here. Go ahead. I do indeed. RIN 2060 AV 49. This is entitled Multi Pollutant Emission Standards for Model Years 2027 and Later Light Duty and Medium Duty Vehicles. So, this is uh, per EPA's authority under the Clean Air Act Section 202A. Uh, EPA is uh, proposing emission standards for greenhouse uh, gases and criteria pollutants for the light duty vehicle sector and heavy duty vehicle sector class 2B and 3. Uh, the standards will begin with model year 2027 light duty vehicles through model year 2030. Um, and I note that this action is also supported by Executive Order 14037 that was uh, titled Strengthening American Leadership in Clean Cars and Trucks. So the EPA will coordinate with the Department of Transportation in developing this proposal. Um, so the EPA has indicated that air pollution from motor vehicles continues to impact public health and the environment. Uh, the EPA has also indicated that the effects of climate change represent a rapidly growing threat to human health and the environment and are caused by greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicle transportation as well as other sources. Uh, therefore, the EPA pro has proposed new, uh, more stringent emission standards for GHGs and criteria pollutants for these sectors, light duty vehicles and medium duty vehicles that would phase in over the model years 2027 and later. And EPA has used a combination of literature review, data analysis, modeling, laboratory testing to develop the needed scientific and technical basis for this action. Uh, the analytical methods used have been applied in other actions that are not new to the agency. The EPA also considered recommendations from the SAB's previous reviews of light duty GHG rules and the most recent report from the National Academy of Sciences regarding technology and policy recommendations for improving fuel economy and reducing GHG emissions. Uh, so I'd also note that the EPA conducted peer review on five uh, particular components of this. Uh, three models, Omega 2.0, Alpha 3, and the MOVES model, as well as literature review on EV and hybrids, and an, an, an assessment of the effects of new vehicle price changes on scrappage of older vehicles. So based on all of this, the, the work group found that this planned action did not, re, re, did not require or warrant review by the full SAB um, the analytical methods used to develop the rule have been applied in other actions and the components have been peer reviewed. So I'll end there, Allison. Thanks, Peter. All right, SAB members, questions, discussion, comments. All right, this is another action where the work group is uh, recommending that no review of science is warranted. If there are no comments or questions, then I would ask for a motion to affirm the work group recommendation. I'll motion. This is June. Thank I you, can Dr. second. Thank you, Dr. Shakrabadi. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, so the motion carries. Thank you. And Peter, I think this is your final of your four. Okay, this is RIN 2060 AV 79, um, and it deals with state implementation plans or SIPs and restatement of startup shutdown and malfunction, that's SSM policy findings of inadequacy and amendment provisions applying to excess emissions during SSM periods. Um, so obviously for many operations, the maximum or the, the most emission is gonna come during a startup or shutdown or if there's some sort of malfunction. So this deals specifically with that under the 1990 Clean Air Act, 
uh, the the Clean Air Act states that the must EPA must specify the manner in which national primary and secondary ambient air quality standards will be achieved and maintained within each air quality control region in, in each state. So on May 22nd of 2015, the EPA issued a final rule to ensure states have plans in place that require sources across the country to follow air pollution rules during times when the facility is um, engaging in SSM, startup shutdown, or when a malfunction occurs. Uh, the EPA weakened its 2015 SSM policy via an October 2020 memo, but that memo was withdrawn in September 2021. So in accordance with EPA's policy for state implementation plan provisions that apply to um, excess emissions during SSM, um, which is outlined in EPA's 2015 SSM SIP action, the EPA is proposing to reinstate its findings of substantial inadequacy that were withdrawn in 2020, specifically for three states, Texas, North Carolina, and Iowa, for SSM provisions in those states' SIPs that do not comply with statutory requirements. And I would note that it wasn't all of those states, but in many cases, it was uh, individual um, regions within the states where there were compliance issues. So EPA is also proposing to issue new findings of substantial inadequacy in SIP calls for additional SSM provisions as um, deficient, identified as deficient by the agency. So the SAB work group finds that this is primarily an administrative action that does not involve new science or new scientific approaches. It applies partially because of legal actions um, and therefore we feel that SAB review is not warranted. So that's my summary. Thank you, Dr. Thorne. Sorry, that was a little complicated, a lot of acronyms, but it's pretty legalese, so my apologies. Okay, well, let's see if anyone has any questions or comments. So this is about state implementation plans, and the work group has uh, recommended that no review is warranted because it does not involve new science or new scientific approaches. All right, well, seeing no comment or question, I would ask for then a motion to affirm. I'll move to affirm this. I'll second, Elmer. Thank you, Dr. Elmer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. The motion carries then. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Thorne, for those four regulatory actions. Uh, we're moving for the next three to Dr. Amanda Rodewald. She's going to introduce each of these next three. And you know, as you can see in our agenda, we have a range of actions from some extremely consequential ones to others that are really administrative or much smaller. And um, we look at all of them. So, and we bring them all to the full board to affirm what the work group screening has done. So we we do not sort of decide on your behalf. And so that's why you're seeing a series of these, some of which are huge things and some of which are much more uh, modest in scope. Uh, Dr. Rodewald, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so for the first one, REN 2060 AU35, this is revisions and confidentiality determinations for data elements under the greenhouse gas reporting rule. Um, so the greenhouse gas reporting program um, currently requires the reporting of greenhouse gas um, data and other relevant information from large um, greenhouse gas emission sources fuel and industrial gas suppliers, and carbon dioxide injection sites within the U.S. So there are about 8,000 facilities then that are required to report these emissions each year. Um, so the data that are reported are um, intended to be, they must be made available to the public unless the EPA has determined on a, currently on a case-by-case -case method um, whether or not they qualify for being treated as confidential. And so that um, there are a large number of entities that are reporting under this act. And currently the um, issue is that the amount of data that um, are reported and must be reviewed um, means that these case-by-case -case determinations just are not 
really feasible anymore. They're not going to result in a timely release of non-confidential data. And so what this rule is doing is it's revising some of the provisions of this um, program that are going to now improve the quality and the confidentiality or the consistency rather of the data collected um, to streamline and improve the implementation process and to clarify certain provisions that have been um, unclear or confusing to different entities that are reporting. Um, this rule also will revise those confidentiality determinations um, and so the working group has recommended that this not be reviewed by the chartered SAB because again, like um, Dr. Cullen was mentioning, this is one of those, um, those actions that's more administrative in nature. Thank you, Dr. Riddlewell. This one was screened um, in July, 2022, and then in January, 2023, and then discussed with the work group in 2023 in January. So it, it has been vetted pretty thoroughly. Are there comments or questions from SAB members? All right, well, seeing none, I would then ask for a motion to affirm the work group recommendation of no review of science warranted. I move that we, so uh, okay, I'll second then. <laughs> I have Dr. Olmsted seconding. I don't actually know who was, First there. That was Mark LeChevalier. Oh, Mark LeChevalier. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries and we will move to Dr. Riddlewell, your second. Okay, great. This one is RIN 2060 AB 53. It's a bit of a mouthful here. The National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. So specifically then for coal and oil fired electric utility steam generating units, review of the residual risk and technology review. Okay, so, um, so what's going on here is um, in February 2022, the EPA published a notice of um, proposed rulemaking that would reaffirm the need to regulate coal and oil fired electric utility generating units under the Clean Air Act. I mean, in that same action, the EPA solicited information on the cost and performance of new or improved technologies that can control hazardous air pollutant emissions. Um, they requested information on improved methods of operation and also on other risk related um, details and information. So this solicitation from the EPA was intended to further um, and support their assessment of the mercury and air toxic standards residual risk and technology review. So based on the information that was provided um, in response to that solicitation, EPA has now proposed amendments to the standards that are going to take into account any developments in the practices, the processes or control technologies um, as consistent with what's directed by the Clean Air Act. And so some of these amendments include um, revisions to make a more stringent standard for non-mercury hazardous air pollutants, um, you know, specifically the, um, the non-mercury metal surrogate filterable particulate matter um, that's emitted by existing coal-fired um, electric utility generating units. Um, they're also adding a requirement that all electric utility generating units that are affected by the standards must comply with a filterable um, particulate matter particulate matter standards um, using PM continuous emission monitoring systems. And they're also making the mercury emission standard for the lignite fired um, electric generating utility um, units to, um, to be more stringent and also consistent with what's required for other types of coal. So the SAB work group recommends that this planned action is does not warrant a review because it appears to be based on sound science that's in line with existing approaches and regulations um, that are already in place um, to reduce particulate um, matter emissions. Thanks, Dr. Rodewald. Discussion 
comments, questions? All right, seeing none, then I would call for a motion to affirm the work group recommendation of no review warranted. I move to approve Sylvie Bruder. Thanks, Dr. Bruder. Do we I second something? Marjorie Aileon. Thank you, Dr. Aileon. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Oh, it sounds like those were all eyes. Are, are there any opposed? Okay, any abstentions? All right, so the motion carries. And Dr. Redwall, I believe you've got one more. Is that right? I do. Yeah, so this one is RIN 2070AK84. Um, and it's the uh, perchloroethylene Oops. and rulemaking um, under section six of the Toxic Substances Control Act. So this rulemaking is addressing um, unreasonable risks of the um, perchloroethylene or per, um, as it's sometimes called, identified in a risk evaluation that was completed under the Toxic Substances Control Act. Um, so perk is a solvent that's commonly used in dry cleaning operations to help dissolve um, greases, oils, waxes. Um, it's used in ingredients in a wide range of products that are ranging from like water repellents, paint removers, printing inks, glues, sealants, polishes, lubricants. Um, so this has a pretty wide just, use. Just a minute, Dr. Rodewald. Someone I think needs to mute and I can't tell exactly who that might be, but if you're not speaking right now, please mute because I think we're having a little trouble hearing Dr. Rodewald. Thank you. Super, thanks. So the EPA has reviewed the science related to the risks and exposures and hazards associated with PERC, along with any other uncertainties and other relevant information. And it's also solicited input from the public and from peer reviewers. So in that review, the EPA determined that PERC presents an unreasonable risk of injury to health, um, and that's because of known significant adverse health effects that are associated with exposure um, to PERC because, um, you know, in part or primarily because it's a neurotoxin and, um, and also likely a human carcinogen. So the action um, that's part of this rule is complying with the Toxic Substances Control Act that requires the EPA to address any, um, by rule, any unreasonable risk of injury um, to health or the environment. So the specific actions that are part of this rule revolve around some prohibitions of use, um, workplace controls, record keeping and reporting requirements, and also conditions for emergency use of PERCs. Um, this action was screened by the SAB work group in this past January, and it was categorized as not recommended for um, SAB consideration. And that's because the science and risk evaluations have already been peer reviewed um, in May 2020, I believe, by the um, by the TSCA Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals. So it would be a it would be redundant to review it again. Thanks, Dr. Rodewall. So comments or questions? This is Perk rulemaking under Tosca. Any SAB members with comments? All right. We, we do defer to peer reviews by CASAC, by the Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals, et cetera. So that's the rationale here. Uh, do I have a motion to affirm the recommendation of no review? This is Joe, so moved. Thank you, Dr. Second. Arva. Thank you, who was that? This is Mr. Chu, this is Wei Shui. Oh, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. And thank you, Dr. Rodewall, that was terrific. All right, we're moving now into a set of four planned actions that will be introduced by Dr. Olmsted. 
Uh, she'll begin discussion of each one and then we'll open it up to broader board discussion and then do our voting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cullen. And the first one here is RIN 2060 AB50. Uh, this one is the Greenhouse Gas Emission Standards Rule for Heavy Duty Engines and Vehicles Phase 3. So you just heard Dr. Thorne talk about a different rule, similar intent for light duty vehicles. This one is for heavy duty vehicles. Um, Per EPA's authority under Clean Air Act Section 202A, EPA is proposing emission standards for greenhouse gases for these uh, the vehicles in this sector. They're proposing action to further reduce GHG air pollution from heavy-duty highway, um, often referred to as heavy-duty vehicles across the United States. And despite the significant emissions reductions achieved by previous rulemakings, greenhouse gas emissions from heavy-duty vehicles continue to impact public health, welfare, and the environment. And the transportation sector is uh, the largest U.S. source of GHG emissions, representing about 27% of the total. Um, within that sector, heavy-duty vehicles are the second largest contributor to GHG emissions and responsible for about 25% of emissions in the sector. Um, so the EPA has proposed standards that would begin with model year 2027 heavy duty vehicles and then phase through model year 2032. They have used information from literature reviews, data analysis, modeling, and lab testing to develop the scientific and technical basis for the rule. Um, EPA considered greenhouse gas and non-greenhouse gas emissions using the same model that uh, Dr. Thorne discussed earlier, the MOVES model which has been used on a regular basis for rulemakings um, using current literature and data sources. Um, EPA used updated emissions rates to support the proposal uh, and also an established process for updating emissions inputs for the MOVES model. And they conducted a peer review of the update on the emissions rates for the model. Um, you may recall that the SAB previously submitted a report on a related rule, the control of air pollution from new motor vehicles, heavy duty engine and vehicle standards. This was focused on non-GHG pollutants, um, lowering allowable NOx, PM, hydrocarbon, and other emissions uh, beginning in model year 2027, the same year here. One of our recommendations in that report was to quantify and monetize the climate benefits from reduced CO2 emissions because of that rule. And they've done so, the agency's done so in this rule using the social cost of greenhouse gas estimates from the federal inter interagency working group. Um, so the work group finds that this planned action does not warrant review by the chartered SAB. It's uh, supported by information from literature reviews, established analytical processes, um, the EPA considered greenhouse gas and non-greenhouse gas emissions using the MOVES model, which is well established uh, with updated emissions rates used for the proposal. And those were again, peer reviewed. Um, so that was our, our recommendation. Thanks, Sheila. And the work group did have a briefing on this one as well from EPA, which was much appreciated. Comments and questions from the board. We have a recommendation of no review warranted from the work group. Seeing no, seeing no comments or questions, I was just going to ask for a motion and I've already got one from Dr. Le Chevalier, I think. A second. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Honorio. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, the motion carries and Dr. Olmsted, we move to your second. Thank you, Dr. Cullen. This one is RIN 2050 AH14. Uh, the title is Hazardous and Solid Waste Management System, Disposal of Coal Combustion Residuals from Electric Utilities, Legacy Service Impoundments. So as Dr. Rodewald said, that's a mouthful. Um, so um, the proposed rule was developed in response to an August 2018 opinion by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in Utility Solid Waste Activities Group v. EPA. Um, the, the court in that case vacated and remanded a provision that exempted legacy coal combustion residuals surface impoundments from the coal combustion residuals regulations. And the court in that case specifically vacated three provisions of um, the, the old 2015 coal combustion residuals rule one that allowed clay lined um, surface impoundments to be considered lined, two that required only leaking unlined surface impoundments to be closed, and then three provided that inactive surface impoundments at closed utilities were not subject to the rule. So the proposed rule requires that legacy um, coal combustion surface impoundments 
comply with certain existing CCR regulations. EPA has not developed new scientific or technical work products in support of the proposed rule. It relied on the results of a 2014 human and ecological risk assessment of coal combustion residuals that was prepared in support of that 2015 CCR rule. And so the SAB work group found that this planned action does not warrant review by the full SAB because again, they've not developed or relied upon new scientific or technical work products to support the rule. Thanks, Dr. Olmsted. Board, we are open for discussion. All right, seeing no hands, then I would ask for a motion to affirm the work group recommendation of no review warranted. Moved, it's Joe. Thanks, Dr. Arvai. Is there a second? I can second. I think we got a couple there. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, then the motion carries. Thank you very much. And Dr. Olmsted, continuing. Thanks, Dr. Thanks. Holm. This one is um, RIN 2070-AK91, reconsideration of the dust lead hazard standards and dust lead post-abatement clearance levels. Um, for this one, EPA is in the process of reconsidering um, July 2019 and January 2021 final rules that provided dust lead hazard standards supporting lead paint sorry, lead-based paint activities and disclosure programs under the Residential Lead-Based Paint Hazard Reduction Act of 1992. Um, this reconsideration is in keeping with Executive Order 13990, addressing the protection of public health and the environment and restoring science to tackle the climate crisis. Um, for the revisions to the dust lead hazard standards and dust lead clearance levels, which are levels indicating the amount of lead in dust on a surface following the completion of an abatement activity, EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention has updated dust and soil background estimates. Uh, the analytical me methods used to support the proposed rule are based on an application of the SHED's EUBEC model. Um, this is a probabilistic model, which is peer reviewed and published and has been previously applied to quantify and analyze children's aggregate multimedia lead exposures and blood lead levels. The model methods um, used for the rule are applications of this model, um, inputs such as exposure and intake rates that have been peer reviewed by the EPA in an external peer review back in 2015. So again, here our recommendation was that the planned action does not warrant review by the full SAB because influential, novel, and controversial science implied in the modeling approaches supporting the proposed rule have already been peer reviewed. And so uh, we were recommending deferring to the uh, peer review that was done by the agency. Thanks, Director Olmsted. Board, we are open for discussion. Comments, questions? All right, we have a recommendation from the work group for no review warranted. May I have a motion? I make a motion, Barbara Beck. Thanks, Dr. Beck. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, Mark so Chevalier. thank you, Dr. Le Chevalier. So we're voting to affirm the recommendation from the work group of no review warranted. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Did we have one there? No, I think it was just a audio blip. Okay, thank you. Uh, the motion carries and we turn to the final item from Dr. Olmsted, Clean Water Act section 404. Okay, so this one is RIN 2040 AF83. Clean Water Act Section 4 for, for Tribal and State Program Regulation. Um, so this one's quite different from the one that Dr. Thorne recommended earlier. Uh, the Clean Water Act Section 404 Permit Program um, is generally administered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This is known as the Wetlands Program. Um, however, um, Section 404G authorizes tribes and states to assume responsibility for the administration of this section of the program. 
Um, it's fairly unusual even for states to have this, uh, this administrative uh, role. To date, there are three states, Michigan, New Jersey, and Florida that have requested and have been approved to assume administration of the CWA Section 404 program. So that makes it quite different from the NIPTES program and other uh, parts of the Clean Water Act where states are much more commonly uh, kind of in the driver's seat for this uh, part of the program. Currently, there are no tribes that have an approved program. Uh, and the purpose of this rule, right, is uh, authorizing tribes and states to assume responsibility for the administration of Section 404. This includes permitting of the discharge of dredged and fill material into waters of the United States, compliance, enforcement, mitigation, and all parts of the program. EPA approves and oversees tribal and state Section 404 programs and the 404G regulations were last revised in 1988, so they're being updated by the EPA. And the goal here is to facilitate tribal and state assumption of the Section 404 program, and they're focused on making the procedures and substantive requirements for assumption transparent and straightforward. So we found that this planned action does not warrant review by the chartered SAB, and that's what we're recommend recommending because there are no science or technical questions being addressed in the proposal, and it does not include any associated technical support documents or supporting scientific analyses. It was primarily kind of administrative in, in nature. Thank you, Dr. Olmstead. Discussion from the board. We have a recommendation of no review warranted. May I have a motion? Make a motion. Thank you, Lisa Lundfeit. Okay. Thank you, Aye. Peter Thorne. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Olmstead. The next three actions are clustered for discussion by June Weintraub. Dr. Weintraub, you may go ahead and begin introducing. Sure, good morning, everyone. Uh, the first one is item number 12 on the agenda. It's RIN 2070 AK72, and it's called Agricultural Worker Protection Standard Reconsideration of the Application Exclusion Zone Amendments. So this rule is concerning um, some changes that were proposed to a 2015 rule that um, defined the application exclusion zone for pesticides as part of the agricultural workers protection standard. And there was a 2020 rule change that um, was then um, contested in uh, in the courts and in preparing the um, the response to that, the EPA actually discovered a factual error in the preamble. So some of the assumptions that had been made as far as um, how the trainings are conducted, for pesticide applications in these areas were incorrect. And in any event, the 2020 rule had been stayed. So this um, new rule is basically officially reinstating the 2015 rule with a few additional changes um, that improve the um, implementation and interpretation that that had been contemplated in the 2020 rule that's not in effect. Um, so the SAB work group did find that the planned action doesn't warrant any review by the chartered SAB because it didn't involve any new science or new scientific approaches. Um, and in fact, the proposed rulemaking was submitted to the federal executive side Fungicide and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA, Scientific Advisory Panel, and they waived review because they determined that the rule did not contain scientific issues that warranted review. So we um, followed their, uh, their, their understanding as well and uh, do not recommend any review by the full board. Thank you, June. 
So we have a recommendation of no review warranted from the work group. And uh, as Dr. Weintraub just said, the FIFRA SAP also um, had taken a look at this prior to us. So we had their information going into it. Any discussion, any comments or questions? Seeing none, I would ask for a, a motion then to affirm the recommendation from the work group. A motion. Thank a motion. you, Dr. Anarua. A second? Second, this is Alina. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, the motion carries and we will turn to the second one in this set. Go ahead, Dr. Weintraub, I think you might be on mute. Thank you. This is item number 13, it's RIN 2050-AH08 and it's alternate PCB extraction methods and amendments to PCB cleanup and disposal regulations. So this is a proposed rule that does involve uh, changes to some technical standards, principally to reduce how much solvent is used in extraction processes for, um, for understanding quantities of PCBs in uh, specifically in cleanup. Um, efforts and disposal. It also does remove the ability to use PCB bulk product waste um, in roadbeds. And it uh, at the same time allows some greater flexibility for cleanup and disposal during emergencies. So the roadbed portion is based on science. It's not new though. Uh, there was a 2005 study that showed that indeed PCBs do tend to leach um, even uh, underneath a roadbed to surrounding soils. And um, this has not been questioned in the nearly 20 years since um, that study has uh, first came out. It's, in, it's been support, further supported in the intervening years. Um, and then with respect to the emergency plan, um, basically it's codifying what EPA currently does on a case-by-case -case basis during emergencies. And um, EPA usually issues specific guidance about PCB um, cleanup during uh, things like hurricanes and floods. And this would just be putting it specifically into a rule. Um, so the SAB work group found that the planned action did not warrant review by the ch chartered SAB because it doesn't involve any new or controversial or technical issues. Thank you, Dr. Weintraub. Board, we are open for discussion. Any comments, questions, discussion? We have a recommendation of no review warranted. Seeing no hands, may I ask for a motion to affirm the recommendation? Motion made, Audrey um, Leon. Thank you, Dr. Leon. Thank you, Dr. Arvai. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. And June, I think you're on your final action. Go ahead. I am. So this is item number 14. It's RIN 2008. AA03. It's Federal Implementation Plan for Oil and Natural Gas Sources, Uinta and Ure Indian Reservation in Utah. And um, thank you, Tom and Tom, for helping to clarify for me. This is a rule that it has been finalized. It was finalized in February of 2023. The SAB workgroup considered it in um in January of 2023. Now, the fact that it has been finalized does not preclude our um, a, a decision by us to um, by the full board to do a review. However, we did decide in the work group that it didn't involve any new scientific or technical issues. Um, the action. What it does is it establishes a federal implementation plan 
under the Clean Air Act that consists of emissions control requirements for existing new and modified oil and natural gas sources on Indian country lands within the Uinta and Ure in Indian Reservation. The implementation plan addresses air quality in and around the Uinta Basin ozone non-attainment area in Northeast Utah. The requirements are consistent with those that are already in place in areas within the basin where the EPA has approved the state of Utah to implement Clean Air Act requirements. And this new rule will help ensure that new development of oil and natural gas sources in the basin will not interfere with attainment of the ozone national ambient air quality standards. And the final rule uh, was published in December 8, 2022. The work group considered it in uh, January, 2023. And uh, at that time, the members of the work group had ex requested that the action be considered for possible SAB review due to its potential to address ozone forming emissions from existing and new and modified oil and natural gas sources. Um, but as I said, we did then decide that we didn't think it warranted review by the chartered SAB because there wasn't evidence of any new scientific or technical work products. So with that. Thank you, June. Board, any comments or questions? It's federal implementation plan for oil and natural gas sectors. We have uh, a recommendation from the work group for no review warranted. Make a motion. Ms. Lonefight, thank you. Second? Second. Thanks, Second Dr. Le Chevalier. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Weintraub. So at this point, we are down to the final three um, actions since we reviewed two of the final five earlier. So we already discussed number 15. So we're moving to number 16 and I will be the, I will be the voice on these three. Uh, we will do 16, 17 and 18. We've already covered 19 earlier. That was Dr. Hamburg in the initial um, action that we talked about at the very beginning. So let's see, number 16, this is emergency release notification. Oh, someone needs to go on mute, sorry. Emergency release notification requirement for animal waste air emissions under the EPCRA, the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. This is RIN 2050-AH28. This is another action where the work group finds that planned action does not warrant review. Um, because the proposed rule would be a reinstatement of requirements for reporting animal waste air emissions from farms, and the EPA is not developing any new scientific or technical work products to support the proposal. Uh, I can give a little bit of background on this one. Um, the proposed rule would amend the emergency release notification regulations and again reinstate the EPA proposed a rule on November 14th of 2018 to exempt all farms from reporting air emissions from animal waste under EPCRA. I can still hear someone who's not on mute. If you could just check your, your mute button, folks. Uh, that 2018 um, proposal was to exempt all farms. In 2019, EPCRA exemption rule was remanded back to EPA for reconsideration. And then the latest proposed rule would amend the emergency release notification regulations under EPCRA to reinstate the reporting of animal waste air emissions by rescinding the 2019 final rule. Again, the agency did not develop any new scientific or technical work products uh, in support of this proposal. I am opening the floor to the board for comments or questions. The work group has recommended no review warranted. Being no comments or questions, then I would ask for a motion to affirm the work group recommendation. So I move, I move to affirm the recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Uzu. Second? I second, Barbara Beck. Thank you, Dr. Beck. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. 
So now we'll move to revisions to the air emissions reporting requirements. This is RIN 2060 AV41. This one, the work group um, again found that it did not warrant review by the chartered board. The planned action focuses primarily on air emission data reporting requirements and um, it is supported by analyses to develop data reporting thresholds and it does not involve new science. This is related to um, EPA initiating an effort in the early 1990s where we were developing a central repository of air emission data for all states. This was known as the NEI, the National Emission Inventory. Data stored at the NEI are used by the states, by EPA. This is for air quality monitoring, modeling, tracking progress, meeting clean air act requirements, setting policy, answering questions from the public, and so forth. So EPA initially promulgated the air emission inventory reporting requirements in 2008. The current action would revise the existing requirements. The rule um, was revised last February, or it was last revised, sorry, February 19th, 2015. And EPA is considering how to improve the quality and completeness of reporting. Uh, this covers HAPS, the hazardous air pollutants emissions from stationary sources and all pollutant emissions from prescribed fires. So that's been timely. Further, EPA is considering how to best quantify emissions from intermittent sources. So this would include backup generators, how to obtain data from permitted facilities in Indian country when a tribe is not required to report and how to address known data gaps or to streamline processes or improve data quality and documentation and transparency. So again, the work group found that this planned action does not warrant review because it is primarily focused on air emissions data recording requirements and also um, did not involve new science. Chartered board, the floor is open for questions and comments. Seeing no hands, then I would ask for a motion to affirm the work group recommendation of no review warranted. This is this Joe. Is so moved. Thank you. I got Dr. Arvai and then a second. I'll second Alina Irwin. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. All in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right. We are then moving, the motion carries. We're moving to the final action for discussion. This is listing of specific PFAS as RECRA hazardous constituents. It's RIN 2050AH26. This action is another where the work group uh, did not find any reason or warrant for review by the chartered board. Um, a review of the key toxicity and health effects assessments is being performed by EPA and ATSDR for selected PFAS to demonstrate that these chemicals have toxic and adverse health effects but EPA is not developing any new scientific or technical basis for this proposed rule. Uh, the origin here is that EPA received pe uh, petitions requesting regulatory action under RICRA to protect human health and the environment from risks presented by PFAS, um, as mentioned. Uh, let's see, this one, I have a little more on it. Oh yeah, the proposed rule, um, may amend RECRA regulations by adding nine PFAS, their salts and their structural isomers and to its list of RECRA hazardous constituents. The RECRA requires corrective action for all releases of hazardous waste and constituents um, at RECRA permitted hazardous waste treatment or storage or disposal facilities. So uh, in this case, again, the work group found that there was not a reason or warrant for further review since there were no new um, there was no new science or technical or scientific work products associated with it. I open the floor to discussion from the board on this last item. Seeing no hands, then I would ask for a motion to affirm the work group recommendation of no review warranted. My motion, Florence Anoro. Thank you, Florence. I'll second that. Thank you, Peter. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Oh, thank you. Any opposed? Any revisions? All right, the motion carries. So that wraps up the marathon of 19 regulatory actions that were reviewed. Some of them, again, small, some of them much more consequential. 
And we are carrying forward two of those, which the SAB has voted to review the science under scientific underpinnings. Uh, so we will move ahead on that, working with the staff office. Uh, we've already reviewed number 19 today. So then I think we have time on the agenda to hear any additional clarifying comments from EPA or from members of the public. This is our second public comment period. So I'd like to ask Tom Armitage if we received any additional requests for comment. Sorry, I was just, <laughs> just checking my email. Uh, we, we have not received any additional requests for comment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we will not have a second public comment period. Again, members of the public are invited to also submit written comments if they would like. Uh, let's see. I also have an additional item. Oh, thank you. Um, Lisa Lonefight has also put some nice framing comments and um, and questions in, into the chat that we can pursue in our summer conversation and moving into fall. So appreciate that. That's going to help get us started. Um, yes, Dr. Thorne, go ahead. I, I wondered if it might be useful just to comment on the work group workflow going forward for the board, um, since we just went through a marathon of 19 of these. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have in front of me right now what's coming down the pike. We have. Um, we definitely have review of EJ guidance coming up. Um, I don't, I'm sorry that I don't have the whole- I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of the volume. Oh, the volume. Well, <laughs> Tom Brennan may have the answer to that. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, it, I think the volume is approximately gonna stay like it is now for the immediate short term, like next few months. Um, and then we're going to have a public meeting in September, the date, uh, you know, hasn't been released to the public yet, but we've been talking about it. Uh, so we're expecting a late summer meeting. Um, and then we will continue this activity with everything that this work group takes on between June, July, and August, so three months worth. But yeah, the pace is going to be about the same for the short term, Peter. Yeah, the pace has been brisk. And I, I will say that um, my intention is to send an email to the EJ committee, to um, Ms. Lone Fight, Dr. Emanuel, uh, Jay Chakraborty, and Dr. Bond, and um, try to convene a conversation about some of the points related to TEK, um, questions about how such knowledge in science is included, how such knowledge in science can be reviewed, can be I think Dr. Emanuel put it put it nicely. Um, just you know, how do we actually how do we actually sort of grapple with and not just defer and place back onto tribal nations, um, but to actually engage with this information and think about how to integrate it into SAB activities more fully. So um, yeah, so I, I plan to send an email about that, and we'll try to get a small group having a discussion so that we can then use the board time to focus on sp very specific points uh, in the fall. And Dr. Alien, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say there have been a few comments in the chat, and especially Ms. Lone Fight. And I think there are some people on phones, and they may not be able to read the chat. So I didn't know if it would be appropriate for you to to read the comments. Oh, okay. And I'll open my chat because I also, when I'm watching the the room, I for hands, I don't always see the chat. Uh, so Ms. Lone Fight add, added to framing around the Indigenous science discussion um, several points to include to ensure a more inclusive, comprehensive, and contextually relevant assessment, SAB should give consideration to adopting or incorporating the following approaches. Number one, expanding the definition of science. SAB should broaden its definition of science to recognize indigenous science as an equivalent, and in some cases, a potentially superior body of knowledge. This implies that the traditional criteria for what is considered a scientific question must be reevaluated to include the insights and methodologies of indigenous science. So that's point one for consideration of a group in the summer and maybe a conversation in the fall, as I said. The second point, uh, context specific criteria. The criteria for what rises to the level of board review should take into account the context of the issue. For example, when dealing with matters that significantly impact local ecosystems, the contextual relevance of indigenous science could be a determining factor in considering it as a scientific question worthy of review. So a second point for consideration moving forward. And then third, diverse expert representation. The SAB should continue to include experts in indigenous science among 
I think it got cut off right there, but I think maybe among its membership is what it was going to be. Um, and then a couple of people commented um, in agreement with having a conversation about these things. Oh, and then there's a fourth point, equitable evaluation of data and methodologies. The SAB should adopt an approach that places indigenous scientific data and methodologies on an equal footing with those of mainstream science. This means not only acknowledging the legitimacy of indigenous science, but also evaluating its data and methodologies using criteria that respect its unique epist epistemological foundations. And, oh, there, it's longer. Okay, so I think I'm getting through it. Oh, I see it. Reframing of scientific questions. Uh, SAB should be open to reframing scientific questions based on the insights provided by indigenous science. This might involve asking new questions or reconsidering assumptions underlying existing questions. And then the sixth and final point that I'm seeing here is collaborative decision-making. Uh, decision-making processes should be collaborative where both indigenous and mainstream sciences contribute as equal partners. This entails valuing the perspectives and insights of indigenous communities and scientists and incorporating their knowledge in both the framing and answering of scientific questions. So these are six points that are being raised for framing the conversation and for review. We can add others as well um, from folks. And I, as I said, I have a set of people who have commented during this meeting and who I think might be interested, but if you are interested in being part of a small group conversation about this in advance of autumn, please send me an email. My email address is just allison, A-L-I-S-O-N at uw.edu. So board members who are interested in being part of that conversation, let me know and we'll try to find a time when everyone is not on vacation um, in advance of September to try to pull together points and think about how to use our time most efficiently with the group um, in September. And then knowing that, as I said before, this is not something that we're going to just march up to September and say, okay, we've cracked this net. We're going to check that box. This is work for lifetimes and generations. And I think we can make progress on it, but I think we'll have to decide, you know, how, how to focus the group um, over time on different parts of this, because there's quite a bit here. And Ms. Longfight is offering to lead or chair the discussion group. So thank you very much for all the volunteers and especially for Lisa for doing this. And I would um, also welcome others who want to email me and let me know that you want to be included and we'll work on finding a time. All right. Yeah. And sorry, if there was anything else in the chat that I missed higher up, let me know, because I think, as I said before, it's very hard to see the room and then also watch the chat. Uh, let's see. I have two hands. I have Miss Lone Fight again and then Tom Brennan. I just wanted to thank everyone. I know that... Um... There's a lot that we're doing on this um, committee that very important things that are being addressed that um, have great impact. I think that um, this is something that is a very important part of the conversation. And I appreciate everybody's um, patience um, with this process. But I think when we come out with the final product, it's going to be something that is innovative and that um, will help inform science and future science conversations. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, I think the SAB always wants to look at the scientific and technical underpinnings of regulations. And so thinking about how TEK is part of that and how it interacts um, and how different kinds of information interact with each other is really critical when you're thinking about what the scientific underpinnings of regulations are. So that would be the sort of SAB lens on, on this is, you know, looking at science and, and technical underpinnings of regulations. And uh, anyway, I look forward to it. And Tom Brennan, uh, you've been very patient. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to suggest that in addition to emailing you, Allison, that it's always smart to copy Tom Armitage because oh, yes. <laughs> he can help pick up in case people are in and out of the office and he can track and organize and help. Yeah, thanks. I wasn't trying to assign extra work to Tom, but but thank okay. you so much. And I, I'll do that. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Tom. We'll we'll all do it. Uh, yeah, thanks. And we've, we've got other people in the chat who have also expressed an interest, but it'd be helpful to get an email follow up just because, again, tracking things out of the chat can be a little bit be a little bit bumpy. Um, and, um I'll email this out as well because I noticed number three got cut off a little bit, but it got I a little bit cut off. Yeah. It, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there right now because it's fresh in our minds, and maybe that's just me, but that's kind of the way my mind works. I kind of like package this up and um, put it to put it to the side and go on to my next task. So just wanted that to to be a part of this, and I also didn't want anybody to think this this is my re one of my research areas, and so I'm definitely. Um, really interested in this conversation. So thank you again. Yeah, thanks very much. And I, again, would welcome others who have other points, you know, as they read and reflect on these that they would also like to include. Um, I think we should, I think we should start with sort of 
the, the broad scope. So thank you. All right. So we do not have a, a second yeah, round of public. Want to, just want to make a quick comment. Okay. Uh, the issue that the uh, Dr. Uh, Lisa Longfight was discussing, I think we cannot um, or we should not forget the environmental justice, uh, which is basically the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of, of those in, uh, concerned. So it becomes important in trying to determine some of these rules impacting minority communities that SAB takes a very strong look at the environmental justice uh, implications in terms of who determines whether there is science or whether there's no science involved. But it seems like sometimes that is lost in the, in the entire discussion. Thanks, Godfrey. And I think probably the EJ committee noticed that when I listed who I would be emailing, I listed both Jay and also the whole EJ committee. Um, so yes, certainly consider that we want to um, be inclusive about what we're talking about. And also we will be having a conversation uh, about environmental justice guidance you know, in the near future. So I think the timing is great. So again, appreciate the point. And yes, I, I was already uh, taking people's name in vain or, or pulling them into this, to even ones who hadn't necessarily responded in this conversation, because I think it's important for everyone to be at the table. All right, so I think that we are about ready to wrap up. We have a plan on the 19 actions. We have a new plan on something new and exciting to do as well related to traditional um, and ecological knowledge. And I wanna thank the members of the staff office for all of their focused work and time and participation. I wanna thank all the members. I would really like to thank EPA. They gave us some amazing briefings at the work group uh, in advance of this as, as they have also briefed this board in the past and will again in the future. And I believe that we are ready to wrap up our meeting. I know that we're quite early and we did not take a break but it seemed like we were close so I thought we could power through. Are there any additional questions from board members? Yes, I got one more from Dr. Uzo. Go ahead. Yeah, this comment is coming from the public comment by what's his name again? Dr. Oh, Enstrom. James Enstrom. Yeah, he says something about ignoring their input. So I don't know. Goes is a public perception. So from what I, I heard him say, that their their comments are ignored. And then they have ideas and it doesn't seem, the SAB doesn't seem to be paying attention to that. So how do we respond to such criticism? Yeah, I heard his comment about examining uh, linear no threshold models, which are something that EPA grapples with and talks about and all of us as well in our work, when we look at regulatory actions, we also grapple with that and look at it. He mentioned that for radiation, uh, there is a threshold. So he mentioned a number of things, and I think that they are actually part of the discourse and part of the conversation as we've looked at, especially air regulations um, and, and radiation as well. But others can also comment on there. I, I took note of his comment because it's never great to hear that someone feels that they're being disregarded. And yet at the same time, I'm aware of conversations that have been ongoing for, for many years about the presence of thresholds, absence of thresholds, linear models. Um, there, there are entire parts of, of EPA's operation that look at these issues fairly constantly and in our work as well. So others on the board who would like, it's not my specific area, but I would welcome others who want to add to that. In, in addition uh, to your comment, uh, I, would, I would just suggest the, um, the additional studies that have come out looking at the effects of PM 2.5 and ozone uh, urban air pollution on populations and new epidemiologic data that's been um, carefully evaluated and considered. I don't think that's been ignored by anyone. Yeah, it has been a focus. Go ahead, Dr. Beck. Um, I'll oh, say go ahead. in the field of um, carcinogenesis and the linear no threshold model versus the threshold model for carcinogens, that's a frequent source of debate and discussion. I will say that um, it's 
rare for a threshold model to be used in ORD. I've seen it with chloroform and one other chemical. I have seen that there's um, more frequent use of threshold dose response models for carcinogens in the Office of Pesticides. So I think there's also been some concern about consistency across different um, components of the agency. So, I mean, it does get a hearing, uh, but it is uncommon for it to be used in a number of rulemakings. Thanks, Barbara. I have Steve Hamburg, uh, Richard Smith, and then June Weintraub. This is well outside of my area, but I, I have been involved in some work that looks at highly uh, spatial, uh, uh, hyperlocal, uh, the, the air impacts, and you get very complex relationships because the air pollution isn't one number. So this is a very, the notion that you take a single point and you take an average number in a city is never going to be a threshold because you've got these highly heterogeneous distributions where there is very strong epidemiological data to show that they can have very dramatic effects on people. So we have to be really careful and simplify, oversimplifying the problem. And again, it's not my area, but uh, clearly the literature shows it's much more complex than the, the, and I get it's only three minutes, but it was presented in a very black and white way. And the, the real world is really messy and complex. And the notion that thresholds, if you can get one notion, one measurement and, and then your own impact is simply not true. It becomes then how do you assess those? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think you're starting to see the breadth on this committee of people who have actually studied this quite a lot and do actually think about and are concerned with these questions on a daily basis. Go ahead, Dr. Smith. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I just want to refer to, I mean, you know, I, I have interacted with Dr. Enstrom a bit and uh, I, I sympathize with some of his comments. Um, I did pick up a little bit on the question of the limit to three minutes and things like that. But of course, we've got to remember that sometimes these public sessions have 30 comments. So we have to be careful about that and to be consistent with KSAC as well. So I, I have some sympathy with the comments he was making, but I don't think I, I really have a proposal for doing things in a different way. Thanks, Dr. I, Smith. And again, I would invite people who wish to write uh, written comments can certainly come in. And some of those have been quite lengthy in the past. Go ahead, Dr. Weintraub. Um, thank you. Actually, I feel like it's a kind of a perfect segue from Dr. Smith's comments because I don't have a proposal for how to do things in a different way, but I think this idea of incorporating TEK into what we you know, what we think about science is extremely relevant here because it's, I agree, Dr. Enstrom kind of presented it as like, you could either have a threshold or not a threshold. And those are the only two ways of thinking about, you know, the effects that uh, adverse health effects of various things. And yet I think when we start talking about TEK, we're realizing, you know, it's not a linear you know, either or, it's not even a spectrum. It's like a whole global um, concept of, of what the truth is and none of us know. So I, I'll stop there, but I do, I, I take, um, I, I think it's all relevant. And I think Al Allison, as you've been uh, reminding us, you know, this isn't something that any of us, and I mean, that's part of us as what we call scientists, were meant to be open to um, to to different ways of thinking and doing things, and and that that we might be wrong. Thanks. Well, this is clearly uh, getting lots of comment where earlier we were struggling to get any comment on certain things. So um, I, I will just also say that I don't think anyone is going to say that this is a simple black and white question. And I think that, um, yeah, it, it's not. But it, but I will say it is not ignored. It is widely, widely discussed by many people. Uh, let's see. Dr. Beck, you are back up. Then Dr. Bond, then uh, Dr. Guckenheimer and Dr. Onaru. Right. And, you know, again, my experience has really been in the field of what's the appropriate dose response model for carcinogenicity. And I do think that there's still need for further discussion as to the weight of evidence that's required to go beyond the default model and what's the difference between mode of action or are you really getting into a mechanistic requirement, which is really not what's needed for defaulting away from the linear no threshold model. So I do think that 
I, I mean, I wouldn't say that the, I, I certainly wouldn't agree that the agency doesn't hear the alternative view, but I do think that there's room for further discussion as to when the criteria are met or not met. Thank you, Dr. Bond. Hello, I just have a process question um, with regard to the public comment. Um, and th that is, do these comments get, get answered or addressed in any formal way? Because there's a difference between actually being ignored and feeling ignored. And, and so uh, it could be that the issue that the gentleman raised is considered and, and didn't find the place that he thought it should, but that's different from completely being ignored. So I'm just curious what the what the outcome is when somebody makes a public comment. Um, I think I think we do want to make sure that the public feels feels welcome to bring issues forward and that they are heard. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate that. And there are definitely public comment periods on all of the regulatory actions as well that are separate from this. This this space, I mean, I hope all of us are listening really carefully when people take their time and give us the effort and bring their comments to the SAB. They're telling us at the very beginning of the meeting, here are things we want you to keep in mind as you deliberate about the regulatory actions that are in front of you. And there's a chance for the board to also respond to and comment and discuss with the public speaker. So um, we did have that space in our agenda today, although no one took the opportunity to respond in that session today. Um, but I, I guess for myself, I would say, I hope that we are all listening really carefully when people from the public bring us whatever comment, whatever is on their mind. And I think they're telling us, look, this is what we want you to be thinking about as you deliberate and put this together with the information you already have and your own background and expertise. So for me, that's you know, that's separate from the public commenting on regulatory actions, which is always open for 60 days, you know, however many days. All of those public comments that come in on regulatory actions in that EPA process, those are very explicitly considered in the writing of the regulations. The comments we're receiving here are about what should we think, think about as we review the science that underpins or, or decide not to review um, you know, existing science or established science. I am taking too much of the floor, Dr. Guckenheimer, and then Dr. Anaruo, and then I think Tom Brennan might want to say something as well. Thanks. Um, I'm hardly an expert on, on thresholds, but my experience in the cases that, that, that I've looked at is that by and large, we're dealing with an insoluble problem, namely that the doses or concentrations of the substances at which thresholds are being set are so low that laboratory experiments simply cannot do enough cases in order to establish whether a threshold exists. On the other hand, the reason that the thresholds are set low is that we're talking about things that affect millions hundreds of millions of people. And therefore, if there are effects at low thresholds, then we wanna take those into account in regulations. So this is a situation, that, that this is a topic that, that I think will come up over and over and over again. And every time it does, the question is gonna be what's feasible in terms of gathering data that is uh, gonna be actionable. Thanks. And it will come up again and again. It has throughout the you know past decades, it has come up again and again, and it will continue. Go ahead, Florence. Okay. Well, my question has actually been addressed. Um, I wanted to know whether those comments were um, <coughs> responded to, not the ones that are coming prior to the meetings, but the ones that come to the SAB meetings, if their comments were addressed. Um, and I know because of the time frame, um, I don't know if it's there'll be enough time for us to get into responding to their comments. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, moving forward, if uh, especially such comment that comes with a passionate, um, a passionate plea for, uh, um, you know, either being ignored or uh, not being um, included in the decision making, if there's a way to 
um, have individuals who have expertise in that whatever area um, come up with a response that would be made available to that person so they feel that their comments and ideas are relevant. Uh, but I also, I'm wondering if also, um, I know, I don't remember which meeting, but we talked about um, some of the things that he addressed in his um, um, comments and also cumulative action and impact, uh, cumulative effects and impacts. Um, we kind of touched that as well. So uh, I just wondering how do we address that to so that it, they don't feel like um, I can make comments and move away and then that's it. Yeah, thanks, Florence. And I do think that the the chance for the board to then engage with questions and, and feedback when there is a public comment brought in this setting, I think that's a really valuable time. And I would encourage all of us to, you know, consider responding because I think that, again, there is a difference between someone feeling that they were heard or not heard. And that's different from someone feeling that their comment had an impact on the regulation or didn't have an impact on the regulation. I think those are two separate things. Tom Brennan, I know you were trying to get in before. Well, Let's turn I, to you. I've been wanting to answer, but Allison, your answers are spot on. Um, everything Allison said, I agree with. I mean, just as a reminder, public comments to the agency on a rule gets put into a docket and then they are addressed explicitly. But the SAB, the comments uh, are not required to, and we, we don't address them individually, but it's uh, my expectation. And, and Allison has made it clear as well that um, allow yourself to consider the comments, to be appropriately influenced by the comment and to think about it as you uh, develop your peer review and, and other activities for the board. And um, I think that's the critical part of what we do. And um, I'm really happy with this discussion. I would say that our public commenter, I definitely got heard today and that this is a great discussion. Thanks. And thank you all. All right, well, that's probably a good place to bring it to closing comments then. Um, again, really appreciate everyone's time and engagement in this conversation at the end of our time, because I think it did spur quite a bit of back and forth. And I think that, you know, different people on the board have different amounts of background with the idea of threshold, with linear and low, no dose, and et cetera. I'm going to get the words jumbled right now. Um, so again, I, I thank all of you for participating. I thank the EPA members who joined us, the liaisons, the staff office, and all those who presented today. I know that 19 was a bit of a marathon, and I think that they all did a fantastic job. So anyway, really appreciate that. We will implement our next steps moving forward, as we've discussed. And if there is nothing further, I will turn to Tom Armitage, the DFO, to adjourn the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I just also want to say that... Uh, I'd like to thank you all for sending your availability in because we are going to be having a meeting for a September meeting. And we I apologize for not having selected the dates yet. We're looking at all the things that have to go on the agenda and when people are going to be available to uh, be able to talk about all those things. So we're going to be sending you the dates very soon and we will be announcing the uh, meeting publicly also. But uh, with that, I want to thank you. And uh, I guess we can adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.